Charlie, welcome to this episode of The Bars with me, Sabali, the only name with a capital in the middle. Charlie, I'll be, you know, today they really can't talk what? Um, law, law things. I'll be, you know, I, I'll be, I'll tell you. Today is the 18th out of the 30 days journey, Charlie. It hasn't been easy, man. Up and down, Charlie. Network matter. People trying to join them things. But still, the journey continues. Today, I'll be having um, Honorable Hamza. Yes, he's currently the unit committee member for um, senior electrical, what's electrical, electrical area. Electrical, <laughs> the corrections, <laughs> the errors and the corrections. So he's here already, man. Let's start, let's start, let's start, let's start, let's start, let's start, let's start. Start. Have you know, I, this show, the back back back. Drop it in the comment section as we proceed. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Charlie. You have no idea how happy I am right now. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> how, how is everyone? Oh, Charlie, everyone is fine. Uh, this show, the IBPAP are part the duo, so everything BI gets BI it should be very brief. Okay. It shouldn't be too lengthy, you understand? Okay, well, I'll do my best. Unfortunately, I think my teacher is a little bit that. That, 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 unfortunately. But I believe you can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? All right, that's The capital letter in the middle. So um straight into action, straight into action. Um Honorable Hamza is a unit committee member for senior electrical uh, electoral area. So this night we'll be talking about um the impact of anti-corruption laws on governance and economic development. So that is the topic for discussion tonight. So let's go straight. Um, the first question for discussion is, Honorable Hamza, um, explain the concept, uh, provide an introduction to the key anti-corruption laws and regulations in Ghana. You should provide us with the introduction to the key anti-corruption laws and regulations in Ghana. Good evening, all. Hello. Yeah, I, yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Good evening. I would like to extend my warmest greetings to your viewers watching yeah. us and then the crew of Sabali Media. Uh, before I um, before I go with the question, first of all, we have to understand the topic of our discussion well before we understand it well, I think. We must first of all understand what corruption is. Corruption has no single definition, but to reference to what uh, was given by Center for Democracy and Government in their book, Fighting Corruption, they define corruption as the abuse by public office for private gain. This means that it is an act of an individual that has been entrusted with a position of authority and such an individual a group or more decide to use that position for their personal gain corruption as you know encompasses a unilateral abuse by government officials such as embezzlement and nepotism it links both private and public. There are actions that link private and public actors, such as bribery, extortion, influence peddling, and fraud. All these things are some examples of corruption. You may not understand that sometimes because you, you, you know somebody who occupies a higher authority and you use that particular person for a particular game, it's likened to corruption. 
Now, this is what corruption simply means. So when you try doing something that you, with the intention is for your own personal gains, then it means that you are corrupt. In view of that, we have what we call the anti-corruption laws or the anti-corruption laws, as people will say. Ghana as a nation realized the importance or the, 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 the dangers of corruption, brought these laws to keep um, the, the activities that can corrupt, that leads to a, uh, an individual to be corrupt. That's what we call the anti-corruption laws. They are action policies or frameworks with the aim to improve prevention of corruption or to investigate any claims of corruption or, or prosecute any act which is done as is seen as corrupt. This is also done by strengthening a number of state agencies and putting a premium on public awareness on corruption and is devastating effect. So basically, anti-corruption laws are supposed to be laws which are used to regulate individuals' activities in not jumping into corrupt acts. And should they be found guilty of corrupt these anti-corruption uh, laws are supposed to be regulations which can be used to punish uh, wrongdoers of corruption. The mother of all these acts can be given to the, uh, the Criminal Offenses Act. That's the uh, Act 29. That's the Criminal Offenses Act 1960, Act 29. That particular law regulate it is the the framework on which identify corruption as a cancer as something that uh, uh, how do I put it destroys the uh, retards the progress of a nation so it has identified corruption as one and hence has to be dealt with for us to understand that particular law when we go to Section 239 of the Act 29. It speaks basically about corruption and its punishment. And through this legal framework, we have other agencies and frameworks and some uh, parliamentary enactments, such as the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice, such as also to the Economic and Organized Crime Unit such as the Office of the Special Prosecutor. These are all enactment agencies which the Criminal Act, the Criminal Offenses Act, the framework, gave authority to them to prosecute or to investigate or to strengthen, uh, uh, to prevent any act of corruption. So these agencies that I just mentioned are some examples of agencies that have been given in the mandated laws to prevent individuals from being corrupt or investigate corrupt individuals or public officers that have engaged in corrupt activities. Okay, okay, okay. So I think um, you've, you've you know, um, said a lot, but we still have more to talk about. You've made mention of the agencies that are in charge of all these things. Um, what is the role um, the so, uh, social security or the civil society organizations, that is the media and education institutions, in promoting transparency and integrity? Uh, the role of the civil society, like I said, the act activities of co uh, corrupt activities are something that cannot be only be given to a particular individual alone. It's not the work of one particular agency that can do it. Civil societies. Can I proceed? Civil society groups are also given the chance because it's, it is a carcass or a cancer or a, a, a distraction that when it comes, it destroys everybody. Civil society groups groups have also been given some kind of uh, opportunities to also investigate, also try to unearth 
any illegal activities of officers that are occupants at, of uh, an authority that are suspected to be in any activity uh, considered as corrupt and they are to name and shame them so that the right authorities will take over from that and fight their corruption. In Ghana here, we have civil society groups like the Ghana Anti-Corruption Coalition, that's the GACC. We also have the Ghana Center for Democratic Development, CDD Ghana. We, we, we have a number of civil society groups that have also taken the responsibility on them to make sure that all officers, public officials, behave in accordance to the authority that has been delegated to them. So basically, the functions of them is to focus on promoting good governance and then based on rule of law, everybody should be able to enjoy what is yours and then resist from doing something which goes against the laws of the state. Also, apply appropriate checks on the power of the, uh, the, the integrity in public administration. One of the th things they, they are also supposed to do, uh, uh, civil society groups are to follow due processes in achieving transparency in payment by extracting industry companies to government and government-linked entities. Where government needs transactions, yes, it should act like checks so that at least whoever it is that has been put in authority can do it with some kind of uh, 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 checks on, on them to avoid being corrupt or doing something against what is supposed to be done. Okay, honorable. Um, well said, well said. So, um, looking at how laws are being made in Ghana, what are the challenges that you know we face or you guys face in enforcing these laws? I know um, yours is to um, you know try to tell us the meanings of the laws passed in Parliament and all that. Um, what do you think are some of the challenges um, the executive arm, you know, or let's say the police and all that, what do they go through in enforcing these laws we have in Ghana? Uh, I will say that um, Ghana as a state has a very strong structures, which are built to fight corruption if given the opportunity to do it and it's normally been done but the challenges that sometimes these institutions face are more of less like the, the interference of the executive arm of government which is one of the arms of government majority of uh, the activities of these institutions are being interfered by the executive thereby limiting them from acting as it should be done. Uh, when we take a commission like a Shiraj like this, one of the leading anti-corruption bodies, it consolidates the work of an anti-corruption agency like the Ombudsman and the Human Rights Commission under one umbrella. But its challenges are that it has no power to prosecute, nor does it have budget autonomy. Everything that it does, it uh, has to be done by, uh, uh, confirmed by the Council of State. Uh, the appointment of the commissioners are done by the president in consultation with Council of State. So at the end of the day, whatever they are doing, they have the interference of the executive or the, the interference of the head of executive, which is normally the president, coming into it, thereby making their work a little bit inefficient and, and or should I say, off on them. We can recently recollect what happened in the case of um, um, our um, Domingo, the former auditor general, where he has to publish his uh, account, and then due to that, there were challenges with he and then the executive arm 
and then the aid, the attorney general, whereby he has to be given leave. Only recently, court ruled in his favor that what was done to give him that break was unconstitutional. So there are always interference in it. So we have a very active and very structured framework to handle corruption. But unfortunately, the challenges are that we have so many interferences from the very uh, arm of government that uh, in, uh, instituted that those structures. We have the Shiraj, we have the Office of the Special Prosecutor, we have the Yoku, we have we have them in numbers. We have even the audit, uh, uh, Ghana Audit Service. All these people uh, or agencies are supposed to work to to curb corruption, but unfortunately, their challenges are always either uh, insufficient operational uh, 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 logistics or financial challenges, and then interferences from government that limit these organs or these institutions from functioning proper. So, okay, Honorable. Um, I think I got a call from um, Honorable JB regarding a particular question. I think that will be the last question for this session. So he was saying that um, you being a Muslim, and then um, let's assume that you are, you've been called to the bar, you are now a full-grown lawyer or something. And then um, you know that um, in Islam, we are against this um, LGBTQ thing. And then the person comes to you and says, um, he wants you to stand in for him. Maybe due to certain things, he wants you to stand in for him. He's part of this uh, LGBT thing. And you know Islam goes against it. So you as a lawyer and a Muslim, how are you going to go about this? Now, this is an interesting question from my good friend, Honorable Jim. Um, unfortunately, Actually, Islam has its jurisdictions. We have the juris Islamic jurisprudence, and we have the Ghana law. These two laws have something in common, and they are things that are not in common. When it comes to Islamic functions, if I'm using the Islamic law to, to, to make judgment, certainly I will not approve that, because Islam has, uh, does not approve same-sex marriages. But then when we look at the Ghana law, the Ghana law is about freedom of rights. So what we are going to do is that we have to definitely consider, and the law at some point in time is not only done just for fun. It is, uh, 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 how do I say it? It is work, if I should say. It is so, uh, a work. People are doing it for, for to earn a living. So when I'm to use it and I'm to go by that, based on me going there to learn my profession to come and do what I have to do, I think I will by law of the state go by it. I am not saying that the person is free. We have our 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 senses working. That's why that our voice is to continue preaching against it. But we are not going to encourage it. When I go to court, I'm not going to court because of the person I need people to. I am only fighting in court for his rights. It is a, the right of the person that I'm giving. When 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 a thief when a, 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 you are when a thief steals you when you are stolen by a thief, and you start accusing everybody left and right. At the end of the day, you are rather fine uh, by Islamic law. What you are doing is rather guilty. Though you have this, you you lost your, uh, your 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 property. But for you, lovely allegations on everyone around without knowing truly whether the person you are talking to is a thief. It's a problem. So for Islamic stance, yes, it's against it. But when I go there, I'm going there as a legal professional to do what is legally right in the face of law. I am not going there to preach religion. I am going there to do what is legally, legally right in the face of the law. When we come out, 
we preach against it. I hope I have answered my friend well. Wow. So um, you 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 be going per the law in Ghana. No, you're not trying to uh, infringe the law of the person. Uh, but looking at the Islamic aspect too, I think, well, uh, in future, we'll see how it will go in future. Uh, there is if, this... if that law. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm listening. You are saying something. I so if to... that law, if that law is going to be passed in future, we'll see how it will go. And yeah. I know that... And I know that um, in some part of the world, we have Muslims over there, and then we have lawyers too over there. And I know they would have a way in dealing with such, you know, a situation. So when, when such law is passed in Ghana here, it becomes an entrenched law. It becomes an entrenched law because it defines it defend human rights. Hello? When that law is passed in Ghana here, it becomes an entrenched law because it, it, it protects human rights. So when I go there to defend it, I'm going to defend it on human rights as per the law list. But if that law is not approved here, certainly it is not a, a human right here in Ghana. That law is not recognized. So you realize that when you, you go there to defend it, it's not defendable because that law does not work in Ghana here. And some other African countries that have already uh, pass yeah. a law against it's that. Passed. So when, when you go there yeah. and you are trying to defend it, you know it is not defendable. Because, it's because Islamically, everything that we do is against Islam. That is, for example, corruption that we are looking at is against Islam. But we have people that yeah. have, that have stolen public money, yeah. and they have gotten lawyers who are Muslims to go there and defend them. In the eyes of Islam, when you still is sin, irregardless to the level of sin that you are seeing, is sin. But people still go there to defend them, and they win their cases. So it doesn't make difference between me defending a, 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 a lesbianism or gay gayism because Islam is against it. I am not looking at whether Islam is against it or Islam is not against it. What I am going to defend, I'm going to defend the constitutionality of that thing, whether it is approved legally in the state or not. So the human rights aspect is what I am going to defend, not the religious aspect of it. Religiously, we all know the stand of Islam on that. Thank you. Wow, wow, wow. Um, I think with all said, I think there are beautiful points you make. But then let's see how it goes in the future. It's been yeah. great having you on this platform. I'm, I'm very grateful you made time out of your busy schedules to have this wonderful time with me here. Thank you. Any, any any last words? I think Honorable JB is watching us. He said he's having problems with his um, network and all that. That's why he's not been able to tap the question. My, my greetings to everyone. So anything you'd like to tell us here to... My, my my greetings to everyone in Accra, and I hope I shall join you very soon. Thank you. I love what the okay, uh, Sabali Media, Sabali Media. I love what you are doing. I pray that one day it should be seen far and wide. Inshallah, Inshallah. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, I'm grateful. I think. In future, to we'll have a better time and then sit down one to one and then have this conversation. Inshallah, inshallah, inshallah. <laughs> it's me, Sabari, the only name with the capital in the middle, and I'm out. <laughs>